Okay, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody that's that's here that's joined us tonight uh, in Clyde Road, and then obviously everybody that's webcasting and dialing in. So plenty of interest uh, in the event tonight. You're all very welcome, and um, especially by webcast, I think there's big numbers uh, on that. But before we kick off, guys, if we can just take notice of the emergency exits and it kind of ask you to set your phones uh, to silence. Uh, very quickly for those joining for the, the first time, whether on webcast or Clyde Road, uh, the Energy and Environment Division typically run around seven uh, evening lectures. So the first Wednesday of each month from October, it's the first one tonight, through to May of next year, excluding January. Uh, we'll be running a number of breakfast briefings and other site visits as well over the coming year. So they'll be promoted as they come up. So um, I suppose just keep, keep an eye on the agenda, the, the events uh, page of Engineers Ireland and the, the, the publications being sent out. So we'll advertise them in due course. So but uh, tonight's uh, presentation is the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme uh, Design Consultation to be co-presented by Eamon and Paul. So Eamon Confrey is the Principal Officer with the Electricity Policy uh, of the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment and has responsibility for promoting the sustainability of energy supply and demand. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Ahern is within the Electro Electricity Policy Division and is responsible for the development of a new renewable electricity support scheme for Ireland. So we'll, we'll let, the, let the guys have a, a talk. If we can hold off on the Q&A until the end of the presentation, and I'm sure the guys are happy enough to address any queries you have. Um, before I forget, for those webcasting in, if you wish to email a question or a query in, the email address is engineerswebcast at gmail.com. So engineerswebcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. So without further ado, I'll hand over to the guys. Uh, so good evening, um, Eamon Confrey is, is my name, as, as John has outlined. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I suppose you're getting two for one tonight uh, between myself and, and Paul. Um, and again, thanks to uh, Engineers Ireland for the opportunity. Um, it's maybe sorry, is that? <coughs> Can you hear? Is is that better? Yeah, it is on. Yeah. Understood. No problem. Um, <coughs> so, um, so yeah. Th thanks again, as I say, for for the invitation. Um, it's 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 obviously a good opportunity to come out and and uh, speak through and, and and the overall design of of the new scheme. It has obviously been a little while in in gestation, and and I, I suppose there was there was an, a lot of anticipation around um, this this consultation. But um, in any event, as I say, it's 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 good to get out and and, and give people a bit more uh, detail behind our, our thinking on this uh, policy, and I suppose just some of the the, the particular features of it. And, and and Paul will obviously get into that in a little more detail. Um, but I thought what I might do just to sort of kick off and just give give a little bit of context. Um, as, as John has, has indicated, I, I head up the electricity policy team, um, and that was formerly the, the decarbonisation agenda in, in the Department of, of, of Climate Action and Environment. And really, decarbonisation <coughs> was quite uh, it was quite a large division, and it, it had really under its roof um, renewable electricity, heat, and transport policy all, all together. And over the summer, <coughs> we were doing something of a reorganisation internally. Um, and to be frank, it, it was just with so many kind of policies in the in in the decarbonisation basket. Um, it, it it just made sense for us to kind of split those out because pre the the split, if you like, um, in in addition to the new res, I also had kind of the renewable heat incentive. Um, I was chairing the low uh, low emission vehicles task force, and I had all of the 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 items around the electricity side, which I'll get into in a second. So. From that point of view, splitting us into electricity policy um, and then heat and transport division uh, made sense. On my side then, I, I retain renewable electricity policy, so I've got kind of wind energy development guidelines, the new res, um, I have all the refit schemes and the administration and management of those. Uh, I have our input <coughs> to the national mitigation plan, and I'll come on to that in a second as well. So it is a very busy division, and then I also have electricity interconnections. So 
I suppose I have responsibility for East West and um, the North South project, which is obviously in planning uh, at the moment, and potentially the Celtic interconnector, which is the uh, the which is at feasibility stage, looking at potential interconnection to France. <coughs> so. I suppose that that kind of covers the, the the strategic areas of responsibility that I have, and then I guess um, as an energy team, um, in addition to electricity policy and heat and transport, which I've mentioned, um, we then uh, have energy security. We also have um, a strategic energy division, and that is really looking at, I suppose, our international <coughs> outreach um, with a particular focus on Brexit, um, north south and our coordination of European Union policy matters uh, and indeed our interactions with the International Energy Agency. Uh, and then finally we have electricity uh, and gas regulation divisions. So there's whatever that is, six, six or seven divisions in, in the energy team. And with <coughs> the addition of climate action into our responsibilities, which came in uh, in May of last year when Minister Nocton came in, I suppose that now means for the first time that both climate and energy policy are together in the one department and it does bring a lot of coordination into, into our own department. Uh, and, I, and in fairness to, um, it has made us from the energy side of it um, be more conscious and alert to the policy interactions with climate. Um, and by, and I'll, I suppose I'll give the example that um, when, I had, when I did have responsibility for renewable heat uh, and with the renewable heat incentive, um, <clears throat> one of the issues that I suppose we learnt as we were developing that with, with climate input was around just the, the air quality impacts of, of renewable heat incentive and specifically um, if you're looking at maybe st stimulation of biomass and what that does in terms of particulate matter and, and, and air quality and, cli and, and climate mitigation. So, so I suppose that's been a learning for us in the department as we have merged those two responsibilities. So I, I suppose just finally on this um, around domestic and EU policy, as I said, I've, I've outlined in broad terms some of the, the, the main domestic, domestic issues we're, we're dealing with, which I suppose can be summed up on my side around just promoting more renewable <coughs> uh, energy across the, the sweep of, of, um, uh, of my responsibilities. And really it's about build out of, of whether that be onshore, offshore wind, solar, biomass, and, and, and a range of, of renewable sustainable technologies. Um, as, as far as EU policy goes, <coughs> And again, I'll, I'll come to that in, in, in one second. I mean, we're obviously mindful of our 2020 obligations and targets, which are as challenging as they ever were. Uh, while we are making progress, um, we still have a gap to target, and that's no major secret. Um, and then I guess we're also at the same time just in the midst of negotiation of the clean energy package <coughs> and what the the outlook is to, to 2030. So um, if I move on then, I suppose I'm picking up and staying with that theme, as, as you will all be no doubt aware, uh, the clean energy package, or what was originally known as the, the winter package, uh, was published last November, um, and it has eight legislative um, uh, uh, directives or, or, or regulations associated with it. Um, by some distance, it is the most significant, um, uh, I suppose, what's the, um, evolution of energy policy, if I can put it that way, at, at, at European level. Never before have we kind of grappled with a package that is this broad uh, and is this deep. Um, and as I say, there are eight legislative uh, directives associated with it from everything um, uh, to covering from markets. And there are three or four uh, directives associated with, with just the market itself. Um, including ACER and including, uh, um, I, I suppose, just regulation of of, uh, of, of the single energy market. Um, we obviously have the Recast Renewable Energy Directive, which I'll mention, speak to in a minute. Um, energy Efficiency, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, Gas Security of Supply, um, and then Governance overarching all of that. And I guess we are closely watching the Governance Directive um, and indeed, the obviously, the, the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, and there are some, I suppose, it's, it, as I say, it's, it's an extremely comprehensive package on the Renewable Energy Directive. <coughs> I suppose some of the headline points for us is there is a, a kind of a de facto baseline um, target for Ireland of 16%. Of so essentially, where we should be in 2020 will become our baseline going out to 2030. Um, it is, I suppose, the difference between 2020 and 2030 at the moment is that it will be an EU-wide binding target as opposed to national binding targets. So hitherto, and, and in terms of 2020, we're dealing with national binding targets. That's not the case. So it's really, it, it speaks to the member state contributions to meeting that overall EU-wide target. That currently stands at a 27% EU target. 
but all of the indications are that that target will only go in one direction and that will be increased um, and the reason for that is when it gets through um, negotiation with the European Parliament who obviously have now co-decision um, we our, our expectation is that target will go higher it it can vary it or depending on who you speak to it could be 30 percent it could even go as high as 35 percent why that's important is because it will then force member states to to increase their ambition um, and I suppose before I go any further the 16 percent would be an extremely challenging target if that's where it lies for Ireland because all the the growth indicators and indeed energy demand calculations would suggest that in a nutshell the pie is going to get bigger by 2030 and therefore our share and our 16 percent of that pie would only increase um, and just to pick up um, and there's been a lot of media coverage on this recently like if you just look at even data center growth and demand that's out there and um, that will severely impact our, our energy demand calculations so as I say it's it's we're in deep and, and, and difficult negotiations at the moment and um, the expectation is that there will be political adoption of the clean energy package by December uh, that is hugely ambitious um, but this this college as in the Commission College seems quite determined um, that we will get that uh, adopted by the by the end of the year um, and uh, so as I say we're, we're, we're in negotiations on that um, I suppose it just also speaks to um, you know opening up of support schemes it speaks to a financial platform that we we'll probably have to contribute to and it also speaks to communities in a very major way around you know bringing on communities as kind of aggregators of their own energy uh, much more hands-on um, for, for communities in terms of taking uh, ownership of their own energy and, and I think you'll see and as we get into talk to the, the res in more detail <coughs> um, it's, it, we're very much uh, trying to shape the policy in that, in that direction to give communities that, that opportunity um, to, to take as I say ownership for, for their own energy um, on the res and, and again Paul will obviously get, get into this in, in, in a lot more detail but I suppose briefly what I just wanted to mention is it speaks very much in, in kind of broad high level terms around communities around diversity of the renewable energy portfolio and around a flexible approach um, it will be an auction based approach and I suppose the questions for us are the frequency and um, you know whether we look at sort of technology specific or technology uh, neutral and there are arguments on, on both sides on that and um, and I suppose it's it's trying at the, at the end of the day what we need to try and do is balance the sort of the costs versus that diversity versus bringing on communities um, and and so I suppose that's that's ultimately going to be can we kind of hit that sweet spot um, and make sure that we we can stimulate investment in in some of the other uh, technologies both near term and, and medium term as well um, briefly then uh, I mean I, I obviously I, yeah, I should have mentioned at the top I, I also have responsibility for the offshore um, and principally managed through our offshore renewable energy development plan uh, and I suppose the comment I just make there is even in the sort of 18 months that I've been on this brief um, it's just been remarkable the reduction in costs around offshore wind generally and again those of you that are I suppose interested in this area will have seen <clears throat> some interesting numbers emerging from Europe around um, auctions in, in say Denmark and, and the Netherlands and indeed our near neighbour uh, the UK most recently and some of the prices are frankly staggering uh, in terms of what offshore wind is, is, is bidding in um, and I suppose that's just it, it says to us certainly that offshore is, is certainly is, is accelerating um, and, and that's a good thing because I think our own natural resources uh, we will in time be able to play a, a role there in terms of offshore on the national mitigation plan published over the summer um, obviously being led out of the the climate uh, s division in, in in the department uh, but specifically we have the electricity generation uh, sectoral plan and that again falls in in under my uh, roof and briefly I suppose the three main actions in terms of actions under consideration are the new support scheme the, the res um, further electricity interconnection and I suppose the future of money point which is a is is well, in some ways, it's it's an old chestnut, but it's it's one that potentially you know would have a, a very major impact in, in in climate policy. And finally, then, I, and I, I have kind of picked this up earlier as well. Um, all of what we're trying to do in terms of renewable electricity will have, we hope, impact in terms of just heat and transport. And I suppose while I had heat and transport in my brief, it was by again, it is by some distance the most challenging sectors in, in which we have to electrify um, because some of the challenges within transport and heat are just are just difficult um, and 
but at the same time, I suppose our, as we look to further decarbonisation, and that is obviously the end goal by 2050 and, and beyond in terms of our international commitments and Paris Agreement and everything else, um, trying to you know move uh, electrification in, in the heating at the residential and the, the non-domestic level uh, is, is, is challenging, and transport, as, as you will well appreciate, is, is particularly so. Um, but as I say, that's not to say we shouldn't try, and I mean, I think in terms of EVs and some of our plans around that and the RHI, and other initiatives that we're looking at, um, we're hoping that we, we will start to crack some of those those tougher challenges in, in that sector. So with that, and apologies if I've run on a little bit in terms of context, but I think hopefully that just sets up in terms of where we come to this. Um, and so as I hand off to Paul to go into the, the res proper um, in a lot more detail, you know, we don't have all the answers. We don't claim to have all the answers in terms of the new support scheme. We think we've put out something that will stimulate discussion and debate. Uh, we have tried to give uh, an outline of our emerging approach. Um, there are some fundamental questions in there that, that will certainly change the energy uh, landscape in terms of communities and in terms of um, diversification, in terms of decentralization. It's not going to be easy, but I think we can get there. Um, and uh, as I say, we, it's, in many ways, it's, it's an exciting time because we're on the cusp of, I suppose, setting a policy for the next kind of 10 or 15 years um, as, as we head out to 2030 and beyond. So with that, I'll, I'll hand off to Paul uh, to take you through the, the, the scheme itself in, in a little more detail. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Amy, and uh, thanks to John and to Engineers Ireland for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. Um, what we're going to try and do is bring you to, through the process of developing a policy, in particular this policy is the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme. Uh, from the initial stages of identifying and capturing a government ambition, whether it's in the Programme for Government or the Energy White Paper, through to the necessary studies that are needed to support such a scheme and to underpin it, through then to the public consultation which sets out as Eamon described the emerging approach. So with regard to the development of this specific policy, this means taking commitments and ambitions in the 2015 Energy White Paper and 2016 Programme for Government around renewable energy targets. It means increased community and citizen participation, increasing diversity in the RESI portfolio, and moulding these ambitions into, through, through a steering group rather, um, into a policy that's delivered <coughs> in a fair and balanced manner. So there's a clear linkage, as Eamon has outlined, between the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme and increased community and citizen participation in renewable energy projects. It was decided very early on through the steering group to carry out two separate reports to deliver this aim. One to look at the economic uh, um, data that's required to underpin a new scheme and a second report to look at community models and how we can increase community ownership and community participation within the said renewable electricity support scheme. Uh, from my own perspective, there's a difference in terms of how policy gets created um, and potentially between engineering projects, and you guys can probably know that more than myself. When we started out on this journey, I suppose, we had no real vision of what the end result would look like. Um, we don't have a blueprint or an artist's impression in terms of what the new scheme will, will look like in great detail yet. Uh, we have been informed through all of the stages that we've gone through to date in terms of scoping meetings, literature reviews, workshops. We've had multiple stakeholder interviews. Uh, we've conducted detailed analysis. Now, now we're at the consultation uh, stage. And then what the information we get back through this process will inform us ultimately into the, the final de design of the scheme. The final picture is becoming clearer as we go through this process, and the res public consultation is a key part of that policy development process. So I just thought it would be important to note the energy trilemma, we'll call it. And we see this throughout this presentation this evening. And it's a balance that needs to be struck between costs, energy security, and sustainability. So we'll keep coming back to that in terms of policy objectives and how <coughs> we can achieve them and which ones are the most priority for Ireland as we are developing the scheme. It's also important to note, as Eamon mentioned, that a lot of the ground rules for the scheme actually are set by the EU in terms of uh, state aid guidelines. So we're, we're relatively constrained in, in, in some of what we can deliver on the structure of the scheme itself. So if we start with the economic analysis. So the development of a renewable electricity support scheme is complex and requires a lot of detailed analysis. 
It means carrying out detailed, extensive economic appraisals under lots of different scenarios, uh, using lots of different sensitivities against a range of commercial um, renewable technologies. As, as mentioned, it means conducting literature reviews, uh, looking at best practice internationally. It means conducting stakeholder workshops and carrying out interviews with industry experts. It also means identifying and assessing options um, and measuring them against multiple criteria. And it means then setting out an emerging approach uh, based on all of this activity and asking the public, including industry uh, and yourselves, the general public and industry representative groups, further your views on the proposals. So in terms of the economic analysis and the economic study, we start with the levelised cost of energy, which is the foundation really for a lot of the um, economic data which underpins the emerging approach. This, um, this provides a comparison of costs between technologies under certain assumptions. Essentially, it tells you which, which uh, renewable technologies are the most cost effective to deliver your, your primary objective, which is um, a certain amount of renewable electricity by a certain date. Included in the LCOE are costs, uh, including all operational costs, capital costs, associated with each technology. Um, and they're generally ex expressed in euros per megawatt hour terms. The level of cost of energy then feed into the viability gap. And this is calculated as the deficit between these costs and what the technology would receive over its lifetime in terms of its revenues. So in practical terms, any, re any re renewable electricity technology that does not have a viability gap cannot participate in the new scheme. So there needs to be a deficit there between what they expect to earn and what, they, what it costs them to generate the electricity. And, if, and then the state subsidizes that through the PSO. So this viability gap analysis is required to identify renewable technologies with similar vi viability gaps before each renewable technology auction. So the idea is that we'd have auctions and technologies that have similar viability gaps would compete against each other. There's a movement across Europe, as I mentioned, towards subsidy-free renewables, and whether this is through zero-bid auctions or through uh, corporate PPAs with the likes of large data centers, falling costs and falling viability gaps support this transition to, to this new world. Recent auctions in Germany and the UK, for instance, back this trend, and our analysis indicates that by 2030, a large number of renewable technologies will be subsidy-free in Ireland. However, in terms of the economic analysis, the viability gap then, going back to the uh, image, the viability gap informs the funding gap, which in turn informs the cost of support. The support mechanisms referred to there um, are the financial mecha mechanisms that we would choose to use to, to, to support each technology. In the past, uh, there have been feed-in tariffs, and they're no longer available to us under the 2014 EU state aid guidelines. So we're looking at uh, feed-in premiums, whether they're floating or fixed, grant schemes, uh, renewable obligations um, are just some of the examples that we've assessed. Uh, just finally, in terms of the impact on the PSO through this economic analysis, that PSO impact is modelled using bid proxy prices um, to help us make decisions in terms of the emerging principles because it wasn't <coughs> possible for us to accurately forecast what the bid prices would be given that we don't know the, the real price um, of some of these technologies and that will only be discovered once the auctions actually commence themselves. So that one slide took us about six months actually to go through each of those different stages with consultants that were appointed and required an awful lot of assumptions and interaction with the department and with the other stakeholders involved in, in, in the steering group. I'll get to more detail on that shortly. So as well as the economic analysis, we also decided to uh, run, a, as mentioned, a, a separate um, report in parallel, which was led by the SEAI, and that was to look at community models in, in terms of how we can increase community ownership and participation um, in renewable electricity projects. So there were two individual working <coughs> groups across both projects and one steering group which was chaired by Eamon um, and led by the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment. The steering group was both inter and intra-departmental and we had representatives from uh, our own department, from Climate Action, from Energy, from Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation and from the SEAI. So what was decided was that we would model a number of different scenarios to be able to inform decision making better. So not only did we look at the least cost mix in terms of these are our targets, this is the cost of all the technology, this, these are, this is the likely makeup of the uh, technologies that deliver that ambition at least cost, but we added, in on we, we added in on top of that the additional costs and the additional requirements to have community benefit and to have community participation within the scheme. In addition to that, we wanted to see um, through modelling 
what it would look like in terms of the cost uh, if we had a category specifically for onshore wind, uh, for, for solar projects rather, um, for offshore wind and for, uh, for bioenergy projects. Just to be able then to measure those costs against what the lease cost or the new baseline scenario would be. So when we refer to the baseline scenario, that refers to the least cost scenario plus the community um, components that have been added in on top of that. So these, these scenarios, kind of one to five, were included to assess the impact of different policy objectives, as mentioned, whether it's diversity, community, citizen participation, or least cost. They were included to inform the analysis um, and to help us when making decisions about how the scheme should look. And, and ultimately, because all of this data has been published now, it's to help people when they're making submissions to the consultation to, to see what the actual cost implications of the various scenarios are. So we can have scenario one, two, three, or four, really doesn't matter, but there's a cost implication for delivering that. Um, and that needs to be weighed up against, you know, uh, who pays for it, how much they pay, um, and what's the right approach for Ireland to take at this point in time. All of, the, all of these scenarios are detailed and presented in the final economic report, um, again, which is made public to assist with the decision-making process from a public uh, submissions perspective. Now, apologies, there's a huge amount of information on the screen here, but these, this is just really to give you a sense of the number of scenarios and sensitivities that we modelled and the amount of kind of data that we were churning at the time. So in addition to the baseline scenario, there were 16 different scenarios and sensitivities that were modelled. Uh, 10 scenarios were, mo were modelled using electricity market dispatch modelling, and they reflected different uh, renewable el electricity mixes different renewable electricity targets and different electricity demand levels. Six additional sensitivities reflecting different technology costs and discount rates were then added in, as well as um, sensitivities around the community benefit payment and the amount of community participation in each project. We can see there's a lot of moving parts. Sensitivities are time bound and assumptions reflect the best available data at that time. Margins for error do exist, um, and all data and assumptions used have been published and can be scrutinized. So we've used low, medium, and high level se sensitivities, and this gives us the ability to measure the impact on the cost of support um, of different approaches taken to delivering the RES targets. Different, so the point at the bottom there, different sensitivities will result in different answers to the same question. So that's the nature of assumptions, unfortunately, and we have to work within you know, the confines of, of, of that nature. And it was the job of the, of the steering group to test the assumptions that we used uh, robustly. And again, this is why all the economic data was published um, underpinning the scheme to give public access to it. In, and if there's something wrong with it, please come and tell us through the, through the submission uh, consultation process. Again, just to let you see some of the criteria that were used when we were looking at the various approaches and the various scenarios to, um, I suppose, to rank them against each other. Like the final design of the new scheme has to be consistent with all of these policy objectives or criteria. Um, what we're saying is that it, it must be consistent with the full list to the, to, to the fullest extent possible. So the, the primary objective of the, of the RES uh, scheme is to incentivize sufficient renewable electricity to meet Ireland's ambitions. Um, however, where the design and focus of the RES can derive additional public policy benefits and value for the consumer, then this is the preferred approach of the department. So we're back again to the energy, energy trilemma, security of supply, increasing diversity, and keeping costs reduced, and the scheme affordable, um, and the need for these energy pillars to be maintained in a balanced way. And we think that we've given that approach through the consultation, tried to explain the emerging principles, how we've come about to, uh, to, 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 to propose them in that way, and we're looking for feedback in terms of are there any alternative approaches out there, and why people would think we should do it differently. So the second study um, that was undertaken was to assess, sorry, that was, that, that's the end of the economic assessment that was undertaken as, as, as part of the analysis. The second study that was undertaken was a community ownership study to identify and assess models to increase community ownership and participation in renewable electricity projects. So that, that process ran quite smoothly. There was a literature review, international experience um, was looked at that then fed into a stakeholder workshop where they looked at all of the challenges and identified further challenges and potential opportunities to overcome those barriers to community participation. The output of that was a long list of policy options and support measure, measures to increase community ownership. 
Again, that was further shortlisted through stakeholder engagement and, and further workshops and interviews with, with key stakeholders within the community energy sector. Um, and then using a multi-assessment criteria, uh, a shortlist was arrived at of policies and measures. So the primary policies and, 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 and measures were assessed using multi-criteria analysis. The criteria assessment were, um, there were there were seven criteria assessment. Effectiveness of delivering investment, complexity, cost to the consumer, risk, cost to the project, uh, sharing benefits, and then other benefits within the uh, seven. So fr from that initial analysis of all of the barriers to community ownership and some of the identifying some of the policies to overcome them, we also then uh, identified two categories of community projects, uh, wh whether they be w what we call developer-led or community-led. So a key defining factor of the new renewable electricity support scheme is that it's going to be a community-focused scheme, whether that's through developer-led projects that have a community um, ownership component to them, or projects that are majority-led by the, by the community with some level of developer interaction. So the community-led projects uh, category also includes wholly-owned community projects, so that, that would fit in there. Um, so it was proposed early on in the project through the steering group that a separate category or ring fencing of capacity would be created for community-led projects. And uh, as I mentioned, this type of project uh, includes wholly owned community projects. Um, in addition to the two different types of community projects, there were three different types of policies identified. There's a primary support policy, which is the main mechanism through which community projects can secure revenue. Examples of that would include ring fencing capacity for community led projects or a mandatory requirement to offer equity to uh, local citizens for all projects. Second type of policy would be a secondary measure. Um, which supports and makes community projects viable. Examples would be uh, soft loans for development and feasibility studies. And then thirdly, the third type of policy um, or supporting measure would be one that both types of projects could avail of. And examples of that would be a trusted intermediary um, or technical and investment inv advice. So there are some kind of softer uh, support measures that can put in place to help the community to understand the renewable energy sector. Um, and in terms of minimizing their risk when they're participating within um, taking up equity offers of, uh, within certain projects. So important to note, I guess, that not all policy policies and measures assessed are equal. Some of the primary policy mechanisms will secure revenue for the projects, while others are, si are, are simple measures to further support the viability of community projects. So looking at the community ownership models and how we assess, how we assess those, so there was a lot of international example, uh, you know, best practice from around, around Europe primarily, but Canada also, Germany, Denmark, and Scotland were looked at in terms of how they do it. Like they're, they're all good models of community ownership. Um, and then we assessed the policy models against the multi -criter assessment criteria, wh which I mentioned, uh, and we identified the top policy options that are suitable for Ireland. That was really important that there was Irish stakeholders involved in identifying what the top criteria were based out of this long list that we had. So uh, then, then what, what followed the identification of the shortlist was a detailed assessment and examination of how those policies could be applied in an Irish context. And all of that information is contained within the final report that's been published, the community report. So people are welcome to access it. It's, it's really a wealth of really valuable information. Some of the ranking highest uh, ranking policies include, for community ownership models, a mandatory equity offer, so not just ownership, but there's also a share in the revenues of renewable energy projects. Uh, ring fencing capacity for community-led schemes within the total capacity being auctioned off, we would ring fence a certain amount for community-led projects. Financial support mechanisms for communities to help them to invest, those people that can't afford to invest, to, to, to give them equal opportunity um, that their neighbors might have if they're not in the same financial situation. Infrastructural support, such as trusted intermediaries and trusted advisors, as mentioned, and then a separate pathway to the grid for community-led projects. So this, th again, we've done a lot of this work. We're not doing it in a vacuum. We would be liaising with other uh, members of the energy family, for example, the, C the, the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities uh, is about to publish a enduring policy approach to connection policy. Um, and there'll be some level of engagement between ourselves and themselves on how it is we can facilitate community projects and getting that access to the grid. So this, this again, apologies for the slides, so it's, it's, it's quite a busy one, but really just briefly to kind of bring you through the different options for what is the financial mechanism that we looked at as part of the analysis and how it was scored. 
So we've done the economic analysis now at this stage. We've done the community assessment in terms of what models would best deliver us the, um, the output that we want. Now these are the financial mechanisms to incentivize renewable uh, electricity generation. So in the past in Ireland we've used feed-in tariffs. Um, they could in theory <coughs> provide a lower cost of support now even, um, but they're not compatible with the EU state aid rules anymore unfortunately. Um, and also they don't perform well against market integration and ISEM compatibility. <coughs> and what that means is that in Ireland to date that generators th that are given a feed-in tariff generally are guaranteed a price you know, for, for their output and that leaves them with little or no incentive to respond to the wholesale market price of electricity. This lack of response then to market prices can result in higher than necessary balancing costs. Those costs are ultimately borne by the consumer. So we expect that the lower cost of support under the floating feed-in tariff is more than offset by the associated higher system costs compared with the floating feed-in premium, which is the preferred approach. Other res mechanisms such as fixed feed-in premiums or quota schemes are generally perceived to be riskier by investors than a floating FIP. These, uh, this results in higher costs of capital and higher costs of support under these schemes compared to a floating uh, feed-in premium. Overall, the qualitative assessment suggests that a floating feed-in premium performs best against the criteria. So we, we've kind of come to the, we've done the economic analysis, we've looked at the policy considerations, we've done the community work, we've looked at the financial support mechanism. So these are the characteristics of general characteristics of a renewable electricity support scheme, um, you know, relative to what we're developing in Ireland. So there are e there are EU constraints that we have to work wi within. So you could call them constraints. You could call them design rules. Um, I suppose in terms of they 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 can they will define uh, what it is we can implement from from a state aid perspective. So. 2014 state aid rules are applicable to all schemes designed between 2014 and 2020. Uh, renewable electricity levels of support must be set through competitive bidding processes. Lots of countries around Europe have, have, have gone down this path over the last number of years, France, UK, Germany quite recently. In fact, in the last few months alone, they've all had uh, renewable auctions. These state aid rules will instruct us that all renewable el electricity support schemes should provide support in the form of a premium to the market price that the generator will get. It also states that renewable electricity producers are increasingly exposed to market prices, must be able to respond to them, and they must take on standard balancing responsibilities. So the 2014 EU state aid guidelines, they'll effectively shape a lot of the new scheme because we'll have because the new scheme will be subject to a formal state aid approval process that we'll have to go through before we can um, a scheme can be opened up. So another characteristic is auctions, and we kind of term that competitive auctions because the key to, to the auction being successful is that it generates a lot of competition amongst the developers who are all bidding to, 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 um, to succeed and to get support through, through the auction. So th this, pro th this gives a real opportunity for what they call price discovery. So under the, floating or under the, the feed in tariff that we have in Ireland at the moment, generators that guaranteed a fixed floor price regardless of their costs. So under the proposed auction structure, generators would compete with each other to win support, with the bid price being the single determinant in relation to, to being successful in the auction. Um, and there will be a number of pre-qualification criteria that each generator will have to meet before they will be able to participate in that auction. So it's, it's proposed that each auction would be uniform price uh, floating feed-in premium. So the level of support set would be to the highest value bidder still needed to, to meet the required amount of renewable electricity within that auction. All bid bidders with offers below the clearing price would receive the clearing auction price. So now we're coming really to the key characteristic, I think Eamon mentioned this earlier, um, whether a scheme is technology neutral or technology mm. specific. So th this is the key design principle of any uh, renewable electricity support scheme. Whether technologies compete against each other, for support in auctions, for example, wind against solar, against uh, offshore wind, or whether they are technology specific auctions, so you have an auction just for solar uh, PV projects. Uh, wh wh and if you did that, the same principles would apply um, of competitive bidding and the premium payment in terms of the floating FIP. So all of the economic analysis that we looked at at the start, based on all of the assumptions that we, that we um, used and all of the cost data that we used, that suggests that in some regions, in some parts of the country, under certain circumstances, 
during the lifetime of the scheme, onshore wind, solar generators, and even offshore wind will have similar overlapping levelized cost of energy bands. So should some of these technologies achieve faster cost reductions than expected, the relative cost between the technologies may change. So technology neutral schemes are robust to these changes, while technology specific schemes are not. So that's not getting away from the fact that there are risks associated with this approach. So LCOEs are developed at a particular point in time, as we've seen, under certain conditions, certain discount rates, certain cost of international finance, location, capacity factors, fuel costs, all that stuff. Technology neutral scheme categories can run the risk of delivering a single technology as a result. It's done so in the past in the UK, for example. Or it could deliver diversity at a, a greater cost than technology specific schemes. So the approach we're outlining here is quite flexible in that we were proposing to have a technology neutral scheme to begin the, the, you know, the, as the first option throughout the uh, lifetime of the scheme. And if there's a suboptimal result to that in terms of diversity, then we could look at having technology specific schemes then subsequently to, to that. But it, it ultimately depends on what, what prices are bid into the first auction by different technologies for us to get a clear view of where technologies are at in terms of specific costs. You know, we do expect that the broadening of the renewable technology mix will increase as the scheme matures throughout its lifetime anyway, and technology costs further reduce. So a key question for the government is at what pace is this diversity delivered and what interventions are required? So this question is asked in the consultation. This is really the key question, whether technology-specific auctions at higher cost are required or are they desired or are they necessary? And it's really important that they are linked back to a clear policy objective given their higher expected um, costs. And so this is a really important question that we've asked and we've drawn attention to in the consultation. Are the public willing to pay more to have diversity? And how much are they willing to pay and at what price? Because the further you move away from the baseline, which is the, the least cost plus community, the costs significantly rise. So that brings us on to some of the control mechanisms that we've looked at. So as, as we've seen, the new scheme is largely going to be shaped by EU state aid rules. Um, but the challenge to the department is how we can best implement those proposed characteristics of the new scheme while limiting the financial impact to the PSO and ultimately to the customer. So if we look at the proposed market-based mechanisms such as competitive auctions that we've talked about, they carry a, you know, a risk warning that I mentioned in terms of they may deliver just one result in terms of one technology, or they may deliver a more expensive output than, um, than, than you know, may be necessary. And they need to be designed in such a way that they really ensure competition, that, that, that each of the bid prizes that comes into the auctions are significantly close, that there's no, not overcompensation for any one of the g generators that's successful within that auction. So the use of competitive auctions will require a lot of close monitoring by um, those that are administering the scheme. But it can be mitigated, that risk can be mitigated with price and capacity caps and going back to um, ensuring there's sufficient competition within each auction. So other ways that government or the department can control mechanisms in, in terms of keeping the costs down will be looking at the frequency um, of the auctions themselves or the auction size. So a question to be asked, you know, would be, do you have, uh, do you auction off 400 megawatts every two years, 200 megawatts every year, 300 megawatts every six months? Does it, you know, and given that we're expecting costs to, to come down in a very linear pattern over the next five years, certainly, and maybe out to 2030, there's a lot to be said for staggering those auctions throughout the lifetime of the scheme and waiting for costs to come down for certain technologies rather than jumping in ahead now. Um, when we don't know if, you know, the trajectory of certain costs may continue to, to drop. So we also have the renewable electricity ambition as another um, control mechanism. So what that means is, like Eamon talked about the new renewable energy directive, do we maintain our 16% out to 2030? That 16% of renewable energy, by the way, is made up of 40% renewable electricity, 12% renewable heat, and 10% renewable transport. So we, we're talking effectively about maintaining a 40% renewable electricity target out to 2030 if we maintain that baseline. That's what's proposed. Um, so what, what we're, we're talking about here is that this sensitivity is in fact the single most important sensitivity in terms of the cost and the impact on the PSO. So increasing the renewable electricity penetration level um, implies supporting more projects, funnily enough, and therefore a cost of support higher to the baseline scenario. 
So take, for example, under the 55% target, we targeted 55% of our electricity from renewable um, sources by 2030, then the uniform price cost uh, would be somewhere in the region of seven times what it would be otherwise if we just stuck to our 40% baseline. And that's because a greater, greater volume of generation is required, but also because at the higher renewable electricity generation um, level, it depresses wholesale market prices, and that in turn increases the level of support required by the marginal renewable electricity projects. So th th there's some of the control measures that we can that will be used to, I suppose, to, to ensure that uh, the scheme doesn't cost more than what is anticipated once it's approved through state aid. The additional costs associated with community-led and developer-led community projects have been also been factored into the baseline scenario. Um, these include higher costs of finance associated with community participation and community, community benefit payments. Just, just to mention, yeah, that um, micro-generation was also explored as part of the economic analysis at, at this stage, and whether or not this is included in the new scheme will have a significant bearing on the cost of the scheme as well, so that's why that's in there as a control mechanism. So go government will have to make a decision on these options in due course, and again, the question is about balancing the pillars of energy policy um, and how, fa how, how fast do we want to achieve diversity if that is a real policy objective and at what cost um, to the consumer. So we kind of looked at the economic analysis, the community an an analysis, the financial support mechanisms, and the control mechanisms that we may put in place um, on the new scheme. So fr from all that, we're starting to get a sense of what the new scheme might look like now in terms of these emerging principles. So, so these have been laid out in detail within the public consultation, and we've asked a question actually about each of the points up on the screen there as we go through them. Um, so we've kind of had a targeted question and then an open-ended question which allows the public to kind of give express their view on the proposed approach and to propose an alternative. So the emerging principles stem largely from the economic analysis and the community work that's been undertaken. Uh, Namely, the point being that there's a number of renewable technologies with a broad enough range of LTOEs that under certain scenarios they could overlap and they could compete with each other um, in, a, in, in, a, in any given auction. So we've looked at technology costs using various assumptions. We've looked at a range of scenarios uh, under a range of a number of sensitivities. And we've looked at the financial incentive mechanisms. We've looked at international best practice in relation to community renewable electricity projects and we've considered EU state aid rules and the movement towards the growth in renewable electricity options and how they might be applied in Ireland. We've also looked at uh, government control and reduced costs, how they can do that best. Uh, and we've seen how a dynamic government policy can be delivered through flexible support scheme design. So yeah, going to the actual principles themselves, all support has been through auctions with potential exceptions for small scale generation or emerging technologies. That's important because smaller projects, um, I think it was under, under 500 ki kilowatts would still be would be entitled to a feed-in tariff and wouldn't have to participate within the auction process themselves. Uh, technology neutral auctions within each c category. The key point there is that when we say technology neutral, we're talking about technologies with a close viability gap competing against each other. Not necessarily all technologies competing against, against each other. Each auction should be uniform price with the level of support set by the highest value bidder. Uh, and then selection of winners based on price only. So some, some schemes will have um, winners based, there might be a, a weighting, we'll say, so it's not just 100% based on the cost that you bid in, but also if you meet certain criteria, uh, you know, in terms of community participation or investment, you get, um, that gets added in to your, you know, as a weight onto your bid. But what we're saying for, ju just, you know, for, to remove complexity from the auction schemes themselves, that we would base the winners on price only provided all the prerequisites were met by all of the generators that wanted to participate. Uh, we need to ensure potential competition by selecting appropriate volumes to be procured in each auction. And that's where we need to just decide through the detailed design stage what will the first auction be in terms of capacity. And we have to give market signals then to industry um, and to investors in terms of what that likely rollout is going to be over the duration of the scheme. Uh, so price or budget caps to be added, as I said, for control mechanisms. Um, interestingly, that's on the pre-qualification rules, they're saying that any projects that want to participate <coughs> in a, an auction has to meet pre-qualification rules. We're asking for the, for, you know, the public through the submission to propose any pre-qualification rules that we haven't already included in the, in the uh, consultation to date. Certainly penalties for, um, 
non-compliance and delays is a key factor because what you don't want to see in auctions is underbidding where projects come in and win and get the contract and then don't deliver because no one wins it if that's the case. So um, while we want to ensure the projects are competitive, they have to deliver the uh, the required amount of capacity that they have su that they've succeeded in bidding to, and if not, the penalties have to be uh, you know they have to be harsh enough to, to, to I suppose to limit the amount of underbidding um, as much as possible. So yeah, these are the emerging principles based on policy objectives, detailed assessment and analysis, and design constraints. Just very briefly, and apologies for going over time. Yeah, just to go into a little bit more detail on micro-generation, because there's a real um, massive amount of interest, like again, both politically and uh, nationally, I suppose, within micro-generation and this rooftop revolution that we, you know, that we hear about in terms of solar panels installed on people's roofs and people getting a fair tariff for the electricity that they export into the grid. So we, we investigated, um, as part of the commitments within the Energy White Paper, we investigated the opportunities um, for micro-gen to be included within the RAS design itself. And the economic evidence indicates that meeting Ireland's renewable electricity targets and renewable diversity ambitions are more cost effectively met um, at the large and medium scale. So as an example, we'll say, so, so, so the higher costs associated with micro and small scale generation compared to larger community scale projects. For example, domestic rooftop solar um, is still close to 100 euros per megawatt hour more expensive than, than large and medium solar uh, by 2020. Now those costs, um, you know, it is indicated that they will come down through the decade, but they don't, you know, they don't become cost, cost par with large scale projects due, due to the amount of, uh, the amount of op operational costs and, and sheer labor involved in, in, in installing um, rooftop solar uh, domestic. So also in addition to the additional costs, the required network charges and tariff reforms needed to ensure self-generation uh, needs to be looked at. Um, we need to work further to identify a fair and just means for compensating self-generating consumers. Um, and then further analysis is required to ensure an equitable distributional impact on the PSO. So in the thinking behind, the, behind that is that in some, um, in some areas, they think it might be that only the wealthier and certainly homeowners will be able to participate in microgeneration schemes. And yet, that would be paid for by everyone who couldn't participate, whether they didn't own their own property or they didn't have the financial wherewithal to uh, to participate. So that that distributional impact on the PSO is is a real concern, um, and the fairness in terms of what tariff those people get for the electricity they generate and export needs to be looked at in the round with those considerations in place. So while we're proposing we wouldn't support that through the main res itself, what we are doing is, is in parallel, we're gonna host um, a workshop on microgeneration to, to, to identify some of these challenges and to tease them out in more detail and to provide real pathways for, for a microgen policy um, for Ireland because there's a massive demand out there for it. But these issues need to be addressed first and it, it probably needs to happen in parallel with the res, which again, the main primary objective is to deliver targets um, at least cost. So coming to the end, so public consultation, so we're saying that the, you know, we're, we're trying to be very transparent about what it is we're, we're doing. We've published all the data. It's there to be criticized if it's wrong, tell us, and we will look at it again. We've published the economic and community studies. Uh, we've published a complete set of economic data. The process is open now for consultation. Submissions are welcome. Um, it's an opportunity for the public to be involved in policy design through your submissions. We've laid out the emerging approach and the supporting rationale behind it and, and why we've come up with these design principles. We've targeted questions on specific principles themselves. Um, as mentioned at the very start, the public consultation is part of the design process. No final decisions have been made yet. The questions are open-ended to encourage alternative views if they're, if they're out there. Um, and public feedback is sought on the emerging approach uh, until November the 3rd uh, this year. And we, as Eamon said, we don't have all the answers. If something is missing, please tell us. And what we just like, thought we'd like to finish, John, just in terms of some uh, challenges out to the audience. So there is a, there's a need to ensure that Ireland has sufficient number of appropriately skilled engineers um, out in the field working on renewable energy projects. Uh, certainly on the next round of technologies, um, offshore wind, large scale solar projects on uh, onshore uh, wind. So. You know, we want engineers to continue to innovate. So we've seen solar PV costs have come down by 80% over the last five years. 
onshore wind, offshore wind contracts rather have halved in price in the last two years. Um, this, this is down to larger turbines, uh, introduction of higher voltage cabling to get power back to the grid, linking offshore wind with storage capacity uh, such as pumped hydro, uh, the integration of battery technology and offshore wind farms. These are all in engineering innovations. Um, on the OPEX side of it, we've seen 80% or we, or we see that 80% of operational costs for offshore wind um, revolve around transporting technicians to offshore, site, to offshore sites. So there's been, I there's been innovation in remote monitoring and diagnostics to reduce the need for technicians to be physically on site. Drones are now being used to inspect blades, reducing the need for cranes and shipping to move equipment around. So innovation like this is going to reduce the cost of all these technologies and what we'd hope is that they'll become more cost competitive with the more traditional renewable technologies sooner rather than later and that enter into the mix uh, without needing to be subsidized um, through spe technology specific auctions at higher cost. So we want you to respond to the consultation, to answer the specific questions, to propose alternative views if you have them. Um, and we, it's important to, an I, I would just state it's important to answer the questions as they're asked um, in a structured way that will allow us to take your responses to the consultation further to and to develop policy uh, in an evidence-based manner. Uh, and finally then, just thank John for inviting us here today to present on this. We're happy to take any questions that you may have. So um, thanks a million, um, Paul and Eamon, for the excellent presentation. If we, we'll move into our, our Q&A session at this stage. So again, anybody on the webcast, if you want to email your questions in to engineerswebcast at gmail.com and days on the iPad, check them. So at this stage, um, if you want to hand over to the room, I might just kick off the, the Q&A myself. Um, just wondering on, on timeline. So I think that November 3rd, is it? Is the yeah, party. What, what's the, the, the likely, I suppose, timelines then after that? How does, once it's analysing? It, yeah, okay, yeah, so it, it'll be into the, into the I, I, I'd imagine it'll be till at least into the new year before we've worked our way through all of that, con, you know, those submissions. Now, obviously, it depends on how many submissions come in and how detailed there, there are, but I'd say it'll be, it'll be in, in the new year before the, the final design, detailed design of the scheme would start to emerge. Then it needs to go through government approval, which can take any amount of time, to be honest with you. Um, and in parallel, we have to start off the state aid notification and state aid process, but we can't start that in earnest until we have the final scheme design and all the costs associated with it. Um, and that's going to take six to nine months in terms of the EU state aid process. There's other activities that we can do um, in parallel with that, but we're probably talking at least the end of 2018, early 2019, before the scheme will be open to new applications, I would think. Uh, Bernice Doyle from Element Power, uh, a developer of um, renewable energy projects, primarily wind, but mm. also of uh, the Green Lint interconnector between Ireland and GB, which Eamon forgot to mention there in this <laughs> list of interconnection <laughs> responsibilities. Um, I, I th thank you for the, the, the presentation. It's uh, clear that a huge amount of work has gone into putting this together. Um, one area that I, I would just like to, to bring attention to, which Sorry, which I think will probably be an area of contention for the wind industry in particular. Um, in your in your 55% scenario, uh, it seems to us that there's uh, very conservative assumptions, and that leads to very high levels of curtailment for wind and solar, 20%. So, for example, um, you're not looking at any new interconnection, demand side management, storage, EVs, or heat pumps, from what we can see, um, and. I suppose to give that some context, if we take the future grid scenarios, which AirGrid has run over the summer, um, they have a low carbon living scenario, which actually results in 76% res E, we've calculated. Um, but it's quite a balanced portfolio and includes quite a lot of EVs, uh, two further interconnectors, heat bumps, all that kind of stuff. And we estimate that that leads to about 6.6% 6 .6 roughly curtailment. So there's a huge material difference there. Um, it's, it, seems, it seems a shame that there wasn't a, a combined d development of scenarios between yourselves and AirGrid, so I'd just like to ask for your comment on that. I'd say that's a fair point. Uh, you know, if there's different uh, assumptions used in the two different um, pieces of work, then there's likely to be different, different results. I do take the point that, obviously, the more the heat and transport sector is electrified, 
the, the lower the level of curtailment that will be required and ultimately then the lower the cost with the higher penetration rate of renewable electricity. Um, I think that's something that certainly we can, we can you know, if again, through the public consultation, we'll take that submission on board. We can go back and, and look at the numbers again and see what the output is. I'm not sure it'll material, materially change the end result in terms of um, what technologies would be within, you know, it, it's not going to change the, the LCOE of any individual technology, but it, it could well impact on the public perception of having a higher renewable electricity ambition and what that would mean from a cost perspective. So I think that's important for us to, to look at that again, certainly, yeah. Uh, Donald Kassan, Gas Networks Ireland. So uh, I'd like to echo Bernice and congratulate the, uh, Paul and Eamon on a very, uh, very interesting um, presentation. And there's obviously a lot of work uh, has gone into developing the, um, you know, the, the modelling and the analysis behind. But uh, the, the, um, my question is around the concept of the, uh, the viability gap. Mm. And uh, I suppose, you know, just looking at it, looking in on it really, um, should that not be market tested? You know, I'm, and I'm just thinking in, in the context of the recent CFD auctions in GB two weeks ago where offshore wind came in at 57 pounds sterling. You know, so the viability gap, you know, the day before that result of that auction, we, all, we would have all put offshore wind up there above solar and above a lot of other technologies. But, you know, the market shows that, uh, you know, that is a viable technology if you believe the result of those auctions. So. My my question really is, why you know why not market test the viability gap? I, I mean I could pass over to, to yourself, but but I mean I'd say the, the, like the true viability gap is the auction itself in terms of you'll see what what the real prices are for each of those technologies, um, and like as you pointed out, I'm not sure anyone could have predicted what those bid prices would be even the week before, you know probably you would have been talking up to 100 you know pounds per megawatt hour possibly for offshore wind. Um, and again, for offshore wind in particular, it depends on on the, on the model of what of, of the grid connection. Uh, some of that is socialised by the state in some countries. Some countries it's built into the developers' costs, um, and there's kind of hybrid approaches that are looked at as well. I know in the UK example, like the, that that included the grid connection costs, which makes those prices even more, mm. you know, amazing to to understand. Um, there is there is about a six or seven year lead in time for those projects, so perhaps there's an element of of their anticipating costs and larger turbines to come in in the meantime, and you know and and they're, and they're taking a bit of, a bit of a bet in terms of what's likely to be delivered. I'm not sure if penalties were involved in those bids or not. I'm not saying there's anything uh, wrong with those prices, but but you know prices are 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 dropping so quickly. Actually, it's hard to keep up. But it, but but the real viability gap analysis will be the bid prices themselves. And what developers can tell it, tell the auction they can deliver the projects for. Well, I suppose maybe just to, just to add to that, Donald, um, I suppose that's why we're saying, you know, we're, you can make arguments in both ways in, in terms of technology neutral, technolo technology specific, and ultimately, as, as we've tried to demonstrate and outline, I mean, government is going to have to take a view on that. Um, you know, again, and I think I, I use the word staggering in terms of just some of the prices we've seen, and that's exactly what they are. Um, but as Paul said, I mean, you know, in, in many ways, we don't have a crystal ball. We are plugging in, we've plugged in a huge amount of sensitivities, a huge amount of assumptions into the, into the modelling, but models are models, and they are that for a reason, and I suppose, as Paul said, the, the, the kind of the, the real, the, the acid test, the litmus tests, whatever, um, will be when we actually get real bids in, you know what I mean, we start to see, and, and trust me, and, and, and I, from the government perspective, we would love to see the lower cost and those kind of numbers reflected in, in an Irish auction in time, mm -hmm. we absolutely would, because you know, the, the I suppose our our responsibility is is around, and, and again, not not to, to overemphasise the point, but it is important in terms of just cost. You know, because ultimately, you know, it it, it is the consumer is, is shipping a lot of the uh, the burden, if you want to put it that way, in terms of the PSO. Um, the dial in terms of, of the, the PSO more generally is only really going in one direction, which is around you know more renewables. So we are mindful of that, you know. Um, but like I say, um, the, the 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 just the pace and the acceleration in in, in costs in, in specifically around solar and offshore is is is, is pretty staggering, you know. And, and we hope that continues. But I think personally, there's probably a lot of 
fixed cost in there as well that, that you know that okay will change over time but not probably as as, as quickly as some of the technology and operational costs you know um but but anyway we'll we'll, we'll wait and see yeah yeah uh, Jerry Dawkin, Irish Academy of Engineering. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And indeed, I've read through the underlying reports, which were very comprehensive, I must say. Having said that, there is one area I didn't quite pick out from it and I didn't quite pick it up this evening. I can understand people saying they want diversity within renewables, but I haven't seen any quantification of why that diversity is desirable. And I think if we don't do it that way, we're in danger of having a politically decided diversity, which may not be the most sensible thing. The second thing is, I have a great belief in the ability for collusion in this country. And certainly, I think any auction set up with, a, say, a target band of 1,000 a, a megawatts it could very easily lead to people getting together in a nice, cosy room and agreeing how to reach and at what price to reach the 1,000 megawatt target. I would suggest that the auction perhaps leave a fairly wide band of possible demand so that that risk be reduced. The final comment I would make is that, uh, and it's related to your earlier remarks, but the urban distribution system in this country and the rural low voltage system will not support at this present electric heating and electric vehicles. And there will be a very considerable amount of investment and indeed disruption in urban areas to get to that point. So I think this needs to be recognised by people who were, shall we say, anticipating high levels of penetration of these technologies. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're, they're very valid points. Um, I, I suppose um, the, the diversity one would say, I, I suppose, just from the, the policy perspective, it's it's a re you know it speaks to things like security supply. It, it speaks to just you know, colloquially, not to have all necessarily your eggs in in one basket in terms of you know, and, and we all know the the kind of the predominant technology that's delivered um, the level of renewable generation we have. One point I didn't make um, uh, earlier on, I suppose, is relevant um, in in this debate, and that is community and social acceptance. It's a f it's you know uh, as I look out and, and look at just where where onshore wind is you know um, there is there is a degree of, of frustration out there there is a degree of just I suppose people um, rightly or wrongly um, having a perception about you know the and, and it's not I'm sorry it's not perception but there is visual impact associated with you know and particularly around turbines um, and there have been examples of uh, we'll say, um, you know, no issues around noise with certain turbines and indeed around shadow flicker and whatever. And, and I also, for my sins, have the wind energy development guidelines under my umbrella as well. Um, and a lot of work has gone on with our colleagues in, in the Department of uh, Planning to try and um, update and revise the guidelines around that and respond to some of those concerns. Um, I think there are things that developers can do to mitigate, um, but I do think that uh, I would not underestimate um, the the challenge for developers of all technologies, and and don't also forget solar is not without its own visual impact, um, and I think it's just developers will will need to um, approach communities in in a very transparent way and in a, in a way where that information is is, is provided, uh, and that they are able to sit down and address the particular challenges or, or concerns that may emerge in, in various communities. But uh, as I say, I just wouldn't underestimate just that community acceptance. It is a feature right across, um, not just around renewable energy, but just around project development generally in this country. Um, and it is constrained um, by the fact that you know we we do have a pattern of of kind of you know one-off housing and dispersed population, and and it also speaks to your points around you know electrification out in rural areas, and and, and particularly the tr I mentioned the challenges around transport, even from a grid management point of view, um, the notion that we're going to build solar in every single county in in the country is just nuts. Um, and I mean I've said this to the industry themselves because the notion that you're going to have grid chasing all these projects into all the various areas is is just not sustainable. Um, because again, grid build out and reinforcement or enhancement places a cost, uh, and, and, and that cost has to be borne by somebody. So, um, you know, I think if, if we haven't already said it, um, 
this is a complex piece of work. Renewable energy is, is, is not simple in terms of its, its policy construction. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to hit a balance and we have to try and design it in a way that, as I say, meets all of the, the different criteria that, that Paul went through in, 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 in some detail. Um, this is, is it working? Uh, this is one in from Neve O'Sullivan from Brookfield Renewables. Uh, one question in the consul consultation relates to the proposed price cap. However, little detail is provided in the document in relation to this proposed price cap. Uh, could you please provide further detail and advise what the proposed pi price cap is likely to be? Unfortunately, we can't at the moment because, I mean, we haven't gotten into the detailed design. So we're going to take the... We've taken the outputs from, from the, the um, economic analysis that's been undertaken. We've developed an emerging approach. We're consulting on it now, and then we're going to take on submissions from the public that they're going to have an actual part to play in the design of the, of the final policy decisions. And from that, then, the detailed design will be worked out. So the principles is that for any auction, there'll be a price limit in terms of how much um, you would pay for that auction, and you'd also have a limit in terms of the amount of capacity that you're auctioning off, but, but you'd have the price cap there too as a safety valve in terms of if everyone came in at a really high price, you wouldn't end up paying for all of it. So that there's ways that you can put those caps in place to protect the consumer. That's what's meant by the price cap. What it'll, what it'll look like hasn't been decided yet, or that we don't know that number. Yep. Hi, Brian and Matt, and you're representing uh, myself. Uh, given that Effectively, this is going to be a multi-billion euro market or opportunity that you're creating. And we've talked about all the industries here, and we've talked. We've people have talked about offshore wind and solar PV and GB. Both of those industries are about a decade old. Offshore wind a little bit older in, in GB, and supply chains have been developed, and companies have developed the know-how, the services, and the skills. Um, how is that fed into the analysis here to so that it's not just the price decides what gets the uh, what gets what projects gets the green light but it's looked at to see we want to develop the opportunity in Ireland either for the products or the skills or the services so that there's more jobs for this slide here that you actually it's a really good slide you put up the innovation and the engineering in Ireland so that Ireland retains some of the knowledge and also some of the euros that the consumer is going to be spending yeah, I, I guess, it's, uh, and thanks, Brian. Um, I, I suppose one answer would be um, we have had, and, and I think Paul referenced it, um, the Department of, of uh, well, now, well, Enterprise, Jobs and Innovation, or their Business and Innovation or Enterprise at the moment. But anyway, they, they were involved in the early stages on, on the steering group in, in terms of trying to you know, assist us in, in constructing the policy. And I suppose the, the reason I mentioned that is that you know th they obviously have oversight in terms of just broadly, you know, the skills uh, development and, and um, enterprise policy generally and regional development and all of that good stuff. So I suppose um, it, it, is a, it is a really fair point. I mean, a policy in the absence of kind of having that developed supply chain is, 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 is going to be ever more difficult to try and realise. Um, I guess there, I suppose there's, what we're trying to do is give a very strong signal and, and in the time between now and, and when this opens and, and, and the fact that it, it'll be, um, out to 2030 and beyond. Um, that's why I suppose we're, we're you know, and, and it is, I suppose we're looking at it from the point of view of, of, of renewable energy policy development, but we are conscious, I suppose, of what I'm saying is that there's a whole lot of other elements that need to be put in place as well. Um, what we want to try and do is is do it in a way where, you know, we can we can build up that ecosystem in terms of the supply chain. Um, I. I think we can certainly learn and leverage our, our, our success stories in the likes of, say, ICT, just to take one example, you know, over many, many years. I mean, we, we are a world leader in, in a lot of, those, in, in a lot of that, um, that particular sector uh, and translate into, into energy because increasingly you see kind of smart, essentially you can play smart in front of an awful lot of what we're talking about, you know what I mean? And, and, and I suppose, well, what does that mean? And it's, it's around data and digitization of a lot of it. Um, and I think we certainly have a, a developed skill set in, in some of those areas which we can tr translate into, into energy. But um, it's a fair point in terms of making sure that even our education system is, is fit for, for producing you know, the engineers and, and the people with the skill sets and the technicians and the financiers and the lawyers and then the accountants and all of the people uh, and all of the services behind it. You know? um, but I suppose 
hem where you know we we've we've an amount of complexity to sort of even realize the scheme so you know um we we will certainly look to others ac across government and, and and the agencies and 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 indeed um the the industry uh, and and professional groups and bodies themselves um to, to, to respond i suppose our job is to give that signal you know um and and hopefully by that uh, we'll, we'll we'll bring on these uh, the, the suitably suitably qualified people um uh, to, to to contribute in terms of the industry itself Good on point. Yeah. No, I suppose just to add that, that the SEAI did produce a supply chain for solar PV um, report um, at the start of this year. And that looked globally at the, at the solar PV market, but I, I guess your question may, may have been around jobs in Ireland for some of these technologies, was it? Um, I, I don't think it looked in detail at Ireland, and so I mean there may be scope for someone to do a piece of work on that. But it, it wasn't a criteria that, that we used in terms of evaluating the different technologies that was purely done, I suppose, on price and then whether the, the mix of technologies um, delivered the objectives that the government have. Hi, uh, Paul Courtney from Kingspan Energy. Uh, we install rooftop solar, so just uh, picking up on your point, you spoke about on rooftop solar in terms of the differentiation between rooftop and ground mount. Uh, one of them was on visual impact, and as I say, the visual impact of, an, of a rooftop uh, project shouldn't be considered in the same as a visual impact on a ground mount, whenever it isn't going to be seen on a, a four to six degree pitch roof, for example. But I just want to ask in terms of rooftop solar is going to have a higher cost per install, per megawatt, than a, uh, in the equivalent of a ground mount system. And in terms of the PV systems generating is being consumed on site by the person below. Is that being considered within the document or is that consideration being looked at prior rather than being exported back to the grid and then imported from the grid? What I'm basically asking is in terms of our generators that are actually the people that are using the generation on site, even though it's possibly, and it is, a more expensive installation. Is that being considered differently, or is that being considered the same as a ground mine project? So, are you are you talking um, about domestic properties there? In no, no, no. I'm talking about so, like, for example, Jagger Land Rover is a six megawatt rooftop PV system yes. in England, where we have in, have installed a similar size PV system could be installed in a ground, mm. uh, sort of in 25 acres. Uh, over here in Ireland, the price of that to install is going to be more expensive than what it is to install on a, a ground. Yeah. However, then that uh, business is going to benefit then from free electricity yeah, from yeah. that. And and that's why I think in the report it, it indicates that the viability ca gap um, for certain types of solar PV projects does close quicker than others, particularly those that have the large self-consumption component to it. So we did we did include that in the economic analysis and that we, we took into account the the uh, the saved, I suppose, um, money that that uh, com companies would uh, would save by, by generating and self-consuming large amounts of electricity themselves, that was included in in the LCOEs for those types of commercial um, projects. Okay, and is that going to be considered then different then whenever it comes to the technology review? Because I know there's going to be a sort of a, a, a good few technologies, a, a, a diversity of technologies mm. as you've spoke about. Is that going to be considered then as different then from ground mount or is that going to be I don't think it would be a different technology part. it's just yeah it's just the costs associated with with the scale I suppose it, it'd be more commercial um rooftop is is yeah I think commercial rooftop in its own right was was a different technology within the original assessment that we did anyway you know there was large scale rooftop and then microgen rooftop so it, it would probably fit into the large scale rooftop um, and then different scales within the ground mounted as well so so it it was already included uh, as a as a technology slash at a different scale um, to other scales within the solar PV kind of grouping once the costs were been assessed. So I'd imagine we'll continue along that train, yeah. Sorry, uh, thank you. Um, David Wittes from Energy Wise. We do a lot of work with communities, in particularly in relation to the area of energy efficiency and energy generation. Um, given that there is less than five megawatts of community-owned generation in Ireland at the moment, 
you said there's going to be a creek qualification system involved. Will that apply yeah. to the communities as well? How will that apply? Because there's no expertise on the community side. The other thing is, um, in relation to urban areas, I mean, are you talking about aggregating roofs or are you going to talk about just giving micro-generation into people? I mean, I have PV and a heat pump. One of the things that personally annoys me is that when I'm spilling, somebody else gets to sell that back at full price, which is wrong. The other thing is the route to grid and connection charges for communities. Connection charges are a big issue, and there needs to be something like the planning system. If you apply that there's a fixed rate that you can connect at, and there's a fixed date you get a connection at. It's just smoke and mirrors at the moment. The other thing is, um, if you want to electrify the heating system, then you need to stop giving grants for oil and gas boilers and start giving grants for heat pumps, which there are none available at the moment. I have a lot of other questions to do with just the scale at which community energy becomes viable, because that's also a big issue. Soft or soft loans are going to have to be important in this because at the moment community energy is too high risk the planning system is going to have to be aligned with this as well and if you're going to have an auction and you're going to run it every year or every two years you need to also figure out how that's going to affect the deployment are you going to have a rush every two years to deploy stuff or are you going to have an ongoing organized system which happens every year that keeps people employed and allows people to to engage in an organized way in planning something. So those are just a couple of my <laughs> issues. Um, thanks, David. I, I might start with the, the one around um, heat points, or heat pumps rather, and, and the ener energy efficiency piece. Um, you're right, I mean, I think um, on the, under the Better Energy Program, I do know the colleagues in, in consultation with SEI are just reviewing the, the sort of the, the supports on the on that side and and we're very alert to um the, the challenge of bringing on heat pumps um and and certainly that's something we'd like to see at the residential level i mean it was tried some years ago you know what i mean probably didn't as in we had kind of a green green energy scheme um and and put in sort of a lot of biomass boilers or whatever the issue then was around just kind of standards and professionalization and all of that and, it, and back to installation which again comes back to just some of those last points around kind of uh, suitably qualified people uh, out in the field uh, installing these things but i think heat pumps is certainly something that has been is, is being looked at and i think you'll see some development on that over the next year or so um because we're, we're very mindful of as i say electrifying it properly and yes i mean people will say why are you still supporting oil boilers and it is a very fair charge uh, to put to us um on the points around community um yeah i mean the the simple fact of the matter is temple Dairy is still the only um example in Tipperary of, of a, a fully wholly owned uh, community wind farm and, and there's a reason for that um we're very mindful of the capacity challenge challenge that's out there um and that's why we speak to things like trusted intermediaries and trusted advisors to try and build that capacity um it is something that i i think we're going to have to look at you know do you do you deploy deploy you know people out there into 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 the counties or, or at whatever level i think we can probably leverage from some of the good examples through we'll say better energy communities and indeed sustainable energy communities which again are programs that SEI um, have run uh, very successfully in, in, in many instances um, but again it is a fair point um, the capacity that's not going to happen overnight um, and you know I suppose in in addition to just the, the the capacity challenge there's the finance piece as well you know how do how do communities go about raising the, the level of finance that we're talking um but i suppose in overall terms um and the reason why we are i suppose majoring if i could put it that way uh, uh, on on the community side is it genuinely is a response to what we heard in the energy white paper and and that desire you know and i suppose just the final comment making i'll, I'll, I'll pass to paul then um uh, you, just the issues around sort of you know um, sort of exporting the excess back in and, and the frustration that, that people appear I suppose yeah we we have we, a lot of those issues have bubbled up during this process um, but I would just say microgen in in its full sort of uh, um, it, it running across the full gamut of issues around microgen again isn't easy and it, it kind of 
it almost starts to throw very philosophical questions for the energy system because you're moving from sort of centralized to decentralized and 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 how all of that is is managed and as paul has outlined in in one of the slides you know there's a lot of good european example but you start to then open up a whole lot of other things about network charges as you you've also uh, s mentioned yourself so that's not to sort of say and or, or glibly suggest that you know we're, we're, we're ignoring it or, or we're just telling people what they want to hear we're not it's just as we've tried to take it off in a parallel process and i suppose the workshop um in in, in the middle of this month will hopefully distill and, and percolate up the, the kind of the key issues that we need to we need to try and deal with No, it is. It, it it absolutely is. Um, I don't know, Paul. If there's anything you want to add on, on that point? No, just I guess you, you asked again. I think you asked about um, aggregation of residential properties. Perhaps I mean there's a lot covered in the renewables energy directive, like the recast directive that's 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 going through the commission at the moment, um, around around renewable energy communities and also renewable consumers and what their rights would be and how they can act as suppliers and aggregators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get paid for that excess that gets filled in. Um, w and that they, they can generate and once they're consuming some that they can then sell the excess so I suppose we'll try and align the policy for that with the new directive um, if we were to try and implement something now as part of this res th like this is the approach that we've taken that you know that we there may be a chance that we would have to reform it at some stage in the future that other countries have had to revisit their policies for microgen so th so th I suppose that's the rationale behind that's one of the reasons behind why we're saying we would we would deliver and just on the other piece around the the wholly owned like the four or five percent you were saying at the start at the start of, of this process like we kind of went on a journey from we were talking about wholly owned projects and and, and now we're talking about developer-led or community-led because you know realistically it's unlikely that you'll get wholly owned projects occurring at any major scale really anymore given the challenges and the risks the financial risk in, in particular and you know and the amount of knowledge that's needed by someone to drive that forward with, within the community so it's more likely you'll have a shared ownership model either weighted in the developer's favor or weighted in the community's favor but it's, it's a shared ownership model is what um, i suppose we we see uh, happening across ireland uh, through, through this scheme I think I think through the new directive, it would be up to the aggregator, you know, if, if they wanted to act as a as a supplier like that, that that they or as a generator rather, that they would have to, you know, meet all of the requirements around balancing, for example, um, that other generators would have to meet once they go above a certain size. So there'd be obligations on them to do that. Yeah. Okay. Then just before wrapping up, um, uh, thanks again for everybody for showing up um, just to bring your attention to a couple of events coming up from engineers uh, Ireland and the energy environment division over the next month so our next lecture will be on the first Wednesday the first of November same time and that will be from um, a study from Electric Ireland in relation to residential demand side reduction so a, quite an interesting pilot scheme that's been run there and some of the results that's being found already um, and again as previously mentioned we're looking to uh, run a breakfast briefing uh, in October and again just have an eye out for some uh, promotional uh, on that. We, we, we'll get some uh, details out on that. So just in conclusion, again, thank you everybody for, for showing up tonight, for everybody that's dialed in, and if you can show your appreciation to the two guys for an excellent presentation. <laughs>